So, one of you, a couple of you brought to my attention that I <coughs> misquoted my syllabus. So there are no free choice quizzes this week. Uh, we've got lecture today. Welcome. Hi. Oh, yeah. And um, then we're going to take Wednesday off. We'll have lecture on Monday. And depending upon how far we get Monday, we may or may not need lecture on Wednesday next week. It is reading week, and I, I try to build in the schedule like a snow day or just a day to, you know, to catch up, but we're actually doing quite well. So we'll kind of play next Wednesday by ear. Sound good? Need a little bit more time to study for the exam? Is it chilly in here? A little bit. Should I shut that door? Sometimes this door... Okay, so that's kind of our schedule. Next week we do have a pre and a post quiz, but we have kind of a relaxed week uh, this week. Wow, that is a dramatic door closing. Okay. All right, the other thing is the uh, course reviews are open, and um, I want to I want to dispel a few myths about course reviews. Uh, number one myth. They don't make a difference. That is not true. Okay. Number two, and I'll explain why I'm saying. It. Number two, uh, it's a waste of time. It's not true either. Number three, men, uh, nobody reads them. That's not true either. So probably the three top myths that maybe you're thinking are not true. Let me explain. Uh, so they they don't matter. Okay. Um, I have actually made changes in this class specifically because of feedback from course review. One of the biggest ones, and, and, and I'm being pretty transparent, one of the biggest ones is we used to have this class one day a week. So it was like a two hour lecture in one city once a week. And we got reasonably good course reviews. The one feedback that kept showing up consistently was, man, a long time to be sitting. And I really am interested in the class, I really like the content, but I really wish it was twice a week rather than once a week. Okay? So this is the first time in years that I've taught this class two days a week instead of one day a week. So what would a one day a week look like? Well, we lecture and about an hour in, we take a five minute break, and then we come back for another like 55 minutes. It's a lot, but it frees up one of your days for this particular class. Okay, so just to put it out there. Um, I've, you know, it takes a little bit more of my time to do two days a week, to be honest. I've gotta be in town one extra day a week, which is kind of, I mean, it sounds kind of funny, but that's sort of a big deal for me. Um, but I actually kind of like, I kind of like it. I feel like I have a little bit more breathing room. I think the pace is a little bit better, but. This, you know, this is up to you guys. So, that adjustment happened. Another one, having access to an SI. That was one of the first changes that, that I made. And I used the data from my course feedback as justification to the SI department as to why they should allow me to have an SI. Because the students were asking, I told you guys to ask for it. And then I took that data and I used it and it's, here's the thing, it's, it's completely anonymous. I don't know it's you. And I don't get the data until after the semester is over and grades are already posted. So I can't like, oh, I, that person writes like, you know, so-and-so, Richard, I'm pretty sure that's Richard's comment. I'm gonna go in and change that. You know, either bump it up or bump it down. No, I can't do that, it's over, okay? So they're completely anonymous. There's no way to tie it to you. Um, doesn't matter. Hopefully that myth is dispelled because it, you can actually make an impact. On, not, not your course, but you can make an impact on students that have, you know, are going to be taking this class. And then nobody reads them. I read every single comment. So let me give you just a little guidance. If you think this course sucks, please explain why. 
just simply like, this is a total, ridiculously stupid class. That doesn't help. Tell me why you don't like it. That's why you're making chess wrong. Believe it or not, the opposite is still true as well. The flip opposite. This is my favorite class. While it sounds wonderful and flowery and, and you know, makes me have you know, a good day, I want to know why. I don't want to just hear that you love the class. I want to know what you love about the class. Or why do you like it? Okay? Why is it the worst class you've ever taken? Or why is it the best class you've ever taken? Make sense? So, I evaluate you guys all semester long. This is your one opportunity to evaluate not just me, but the class. Okay, so you can evaluate two things. I mean, if you think the class is great, the instruction's horrible, or the instruction's good, and the content's horrible, I mean, you get, you get to provide real feedback. And it's not just like, you know, on a scale of one to five, right? I dropped off the round part in Denver. You know, they hand you a card. You think you had excellent service? Take this survey on a scale of one to five. It's this, you actually get to write feedback. Like you can actually type stuff in. Okay. Make sense? Okay. Cool. I, I appreciate that. So the department, the university. I'm sorry. The university, the department, and actually me um, get ranked on course the course feedback. Just so you guys know. Like big deal. And so maybe instructors haven't taken time to, to, to lay it out for you, but this institution really prides itself in this kind of relationship, like the you know professor-student relationship. It's not exactly small classroom sizes anymore as it used to be, um, although I don't think this is horrible. I mean, this is... Yeah, I agree. This isn't the smallest class, nor is it the biggest class. It's somewhere kind of in between. Um, but, you know, this kind of take a pause, take some time, encourage you guys to provide some feedback so that we can make the class better. Um, you know, two examples. If you like the two day a week and you think one day would be horrible, um, you can thank your former. And that, was, that wasn't like one semester of feedback. That was years. And it, finally, I said, all right, let me, let me give it a shot and see what it looks like. Okay? Any comments, questions, or feedback on the course review? Like, I, I know that sometimes, you know, instructors will give you, like, I've heard of extra credit is given for filling out the course review. Have you guys had that happen? So I kind of feel like that's leading the witness a little bit. <laughs> um, you know, if I'm giving you points, even though I don't know what you said, maybe you're more likely to say something positive. So there is an extra credit for it. I'm just asking you to please do it. So I'm not gonna leave the witness, but yeah, make, please take it seriously. So the amount of time that I spend in class explaining why it's valuable um, probably is in lieu of handing out bonus points for you guys completing the, the, the course surveys, okay? We, we tend to have, this class tends to have um, relatively high student participation. Like they rank like, if there's 100 of you, how many of you actually do it? Okay, and I know not everybody comes to lecture, not everybody's here today, it's a holiday week, but um, this is on the recording, so hopefully if they're watching, they're gonna take it seriously. You should have an email that came to your inbox, or on Louie, you can go in and log in. Okay, any other questions or comments before we dive into cardiovascular diseases? We've got three lectures to cover this material. I think we'll be able to do it in two. Um, should we try? Okay, all right, awesome. All right, you're gonna do a little drawing. So hopefully you have a blank sheet of paper. Um, I want you to draw a simplified picture of the heart. I want you to label these parts. That's the first part, okay? Draw a simplified diagram of the heart. And then label these four parts. I think this exercise will be helpful for you all as you study, and it's gonna be helpful for lecture to kind of keep track of what's going on, in particular as it relates to <coughs> heart disease. So 
excited about the class survey. All right, pause. What types of what type of dance do teachers like best? What type of dance do teachers? Don't worry, I'm not going to demonstrate. Huh? Attendance. All right. What is what? What are rotten eggs, rotten fruit, and spoiled milk? Where are they? Rotten eggs, rotten fruit, and spoiled milk. Well, they're groceries, of course. <laughs> groceries. What did the tree say to the wind? Apropos for today. Leave me alone. Very good. Nicely done. All right, back to your drawings. <laughs> By the way, I have yet to have anybody say that um, I, sh I should give it as a joke. So if you hate the jokes, you should probably write something about it. Because they're still here. <laughs> Teenage kids are like, you still do the jokes, Dad? I'm like, oh yeah. What's that? Maybe they'll take the class at some point. Wouldn't that be odd? Yeah, that would be crazy. And then I have two other ideas, so. They're their own. All right, so you drawing a diagram of the heart. This actually is my favorite section of the class, however you ask me. Everybody got a drawing of the heart with these labeled? Okay. So mine's going to be pretty simple. And you can modify yours if you want. Mine is literally going to be a box. <laughs> okay? Some of you are like, that is really boring. Okay? Some of yours was pointy. Anybody do it in red? All right? Some of you are making your hearts. Huh? You can do that. That's fine. I think this is easier. This is the way engineers draw hearts. Okay? So don't expect to get chocolate from an engineer. Valentine's Day. <coughs> and then <coughs> shout this out. So what chamber would this be? Right atrium. What is this one? Right ventricle. And this one? Right atrium. Okay, very good. All right, this isn't on the list, but now I want you to <coughs> add to your diagram some other <coughs> features. Okay, some of the features that I'd like you to add are tell me about the valve system and show me the flow of blood through the heart. So let me get you started, okay? So for example, here we have vessels coming in, correct? And what vessels, what is this one? Superior vena cava. So this is the superior vena cava and this is the inferior vena cava. And which way is blood coming in? Well, in, Keller. <laughs> exactly. Okay, like this. We're going to kind of trace it through the heart. So come in here and then follow it through. Just real quickly. This is, this is review. This is how we're doing review this time. So we have a valve here, right? Correct? And what is this valve? Yeah, this is the tricuspid. And then blood flows from here. Where does it go? Up pulmonary trunk. Right, so it's going to go out. And this is what? Pulmonary trunk. Pulmonary artery. Pulmonary artery. And this is to the lungs, correct? 
for oxygenation. Then where does it go? <coughs> From the lungs, where does it go? Back to where? Left atrium. The left atrium. And this is what? Pulmonary, pulmonary vein. We have a valve here. Mitral valve. Right, correct. This is the mitral, otherwise known as the bicuspid. And then out of the left ventricle, what is this big vessel called? The aorta. That's the aorta. And there's a valve here. What's that one called? Aortic semilunar valve. The, oops. The aortic valve. Correct? Okay. Make sense? That was overly painful. Maybe you should take a peek at it a little bit more. Next question. What is the difference between preload and afterload? And this is relevant to one of the first diseases we're going to talk about. But let's just get this definition up front. What is the definition between preload and af afterload? The difference? Or what other definitions? Like that, preload is myos myocyte stretch, and it's related to ventricular filling. Okay, so if we've got, we're gonna have a couple of terms today. So preload is um, myocyte stretch, and it's dependent on ventricular filling. So another way to explain this is it's the muscle length prior to contraction. So myocyte stretch. So in diastole, or in the diastolic phase of the relaxation phase, as the heart is filling, you actually, in you know, the heart volume increases. And so the myocytes have a length. You have actin and myosin filament overlap at to a certain extent before systole or before contraction. And so the amount of the stretch of the myocyte is dependent on ventricular filling. You have more blood coming back to the heart you're going to stretch during diastole to a greater amount. Does that make sense? Okay. So preload is dependent upon ventricular filling. It also means that it's dependent upon venous return. Venous return is the amount of blood that's entering into the superior and the inferior vena cava that dumps into the right atrium. Okay, that was well done. What about afterload? What is afterload, or what's the definition of afterload? Force the heart has to contract to eject the blood. Very good. The force, you guys hear that? The force that the heart has to work against in order to eject blood, each heartbeat. So it's the load, or force, heart works against to eject the blood out of the left ventricle. So here to here, here to here. The aortic valve is a one-way valve, correct? So it opens one way and then it shuts. Opens one way and then it shuts. And so in order for it to open this way, this pressure on this side has to be larger than the pressure over here for it to open and then shut. 
You guys with me? So the afterload, or the force that the heart is seeing, is dependent upon what pressure? Blood pressure in the aorta. Blood pressure in the aorta. Or, in other words, what we call mean arterial pressure. Okay? So this is dependent on mean arterial pressure. This is important. So, so I know this is a lot of definition. All of this is review, by the way. But the reason this is important is if you have a patient that's hypertensive, what does that mean about mean arterial pressure? It's high. If you have a hypertensive patient, what happens to afterload? It goes up. If afterload goes up, is the heart working harder or is it working less? It's working harder. Do you see why hypertension is bad? And if you have high blood pressure or if the patient's hypertensive, say for 10, 20, 30 years, what do you think that does to this pump? It enlarges and it wears out, right? This is just like any pump that you might come across. They don't last forever. Okay, does that make sense? So this like basic concept is hugely important when you're dealing with heart disease, especially when we talk about chronic heart failure or congestive heart failure. So this is, this is really foundational, and that's why this little exercise helps us to orient us, it, re, it helps us to review, um, and, and, and then we'll, we'll build from here, okay? All right, so the types of heart disease. So the types of heart disease. So we've got um, six that we're gonna look at between today and next week. Congestive heart failure, also described as, or referred to as chronic heart failure. Arterial sclerosis, ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, pericardial disease, and then congenital defects or congenital diseases. Um, So heart disease today in 2019 is still the number one killer in the United States. However, the forecast is that cancer is going to match or surpass it next year, 2020. So cancer technically is number two. So, so in 2019, heart disease um, has taken or is projected to take total about 650,000 individuals in the United States, which is about one in every deaths. So 25% of the deaths are heart disease. Cancer is about 600,000 in the U.S. this year. Um, so number one and number two killers in the, in the United States for sure, heart disease and cancer. Collectively, they, they cover about 1.2 million deaths in the U.S. An interesting fact about um, um, both of these diseases is they're on the decline because we're actually getting uh, a little bit more educated. People have stopped smoking, which has actually helped with both cancer and heart disease related problems. There's less smokers. Um, we've got early detection. Early detection is not just um, people are more educated, but we're actually um, intervening in our medical management earlier. We're looking at signs clinically uh, when patients come in and we're making decisions about either lifestyle choices or diagnostic tests for both cancer and heart disease. Um, but what you'll see, I just want you to understand rates versus absolute numbers, right? So for example, you take cancer's um, peak mortality rate was in 1991. And it has dropped about 27% every year since then. But I just told you it's about to cross and pass heart disease as the number one killer. So how does the rate go down, but the number of deaths go up? Well, our population's growing, right? So just, you gotta pay very close attention to statistics because they can be confusing if you're not you know, watching them carefully. 
Okay. So we're going to cover all six of these diseases. First up is congestive heart failure, or what we refer to as chronic heart failure. So the congestive heart failure piece, we call it congestive because of a lot of the fluid backup that we're going to talk about. There's a lot of congestion around the heart and lungs. And you can appreciate that with this flow diagram that we've drawn, this sort of simplistic, you know, but you take a step back and you look at it and you're like, wow, all of you should be proud of yourself for remembering that. that that's actually pretty impressive that you recall that information, okay? But it's because you actually learned something in 202. So maybe you say thank you to whoever your 202 professor was, right? And I'm not being so, it wasn't me because I haven't taught that class in a number of years and I don't recognize all, any of you from that class, right? It was so long ago that if you were still in the school, then we've got other issues. <laughs> but based upon, based upon this, the, the test score averages, that, that wasn't any of you, okay? So based upon this flow diagram, you can appreciate that we're either gonna get a backup in flow into the heart itself, or we're gonna get a backup into the lungs, okay? So that's where the terminology congestive comes from. Now, it's, it's usually a systolic problem meaning it's a problem with the heart when it beats. And there's two main <coughs> causes. One is you've got a underlying inflammatory disease of the heart called endocarditis. The endocardium is that inner lining of the heart. And so it can become um, traumatized with disease and infection and result in an inflammatory state and that compromises the, the activity of the heart although more rare. The most common cause of CHF is with an abnormal load. And that's like what I'm talking about, where we've got mean arterial pressure is elevated, and now the heart has to beat against an abnormal load, and it can't keep up. So when that happens, when you've got this abnormal load, you've got what we refer to as a forward failure. The heart can't push blood out anymore, so the forward pr uh, propulsion or propulsion of fluid is compromised, leading to a decrease in cardiac output. So cardiac output simply described is the amount of blood that's being ejected out of the blood, out of the heart, and it's usually described or characterized on a per minute basis. So you guys may or may not remember this formula, but cardiac output is equal to heart rate times what? Stroke volume. Stroke volume, very, very well done. So this units of heart rate is beats per minute, and this is what? Liters per, liters per beat. <coughs> Four milliliters. So the beat is canceled, and now you have cardiac output is liters per minute or milliliters per minute. Okay? So it's the amount of volume of blood that exits the heart per unit time. So if you have to work harder, you get less out. If you get less out, where does it go? It goes backwards, it stays in the heart. If it stays on the left side of the heart, then this thing's going to enlarge and swell over time. Well, eventually, if it backs up too much, it can go where? To the lungs. To the lungs. Okay, we talked about this in the respiratory section about congestion in the lungs. Okay, and we'll talk about it here again, but. Many of you will interact with heart failure patients in the future because it's so prevalent. Cancer and heart disease, those are the two. Those are the main two. Um, I had numbers for, hang on, I had numbers for Alzheimer's because I just wanted, I think it was like 150 or something. 121,404 Alzheimer's deaths compared to 650 and 600. So one-sixth the number of deaths for all Alzheimer's patients as for cancer or heart disease. 
So you're, you're going to see these patients. Well, this is extremely uncomfortable when you've got congestive heart failure. It backs up either to the heart or it backs up into the lungs. It backs up in the heart, the heart's working harder. If it backs up into the lungs, now, now it's difficult to breathe. And these patients complain that they feel like someone's sitting on their chest. They're trying to breathe while somebody's sitting on their chest. It's because of all the fluid. So one of the treatments that is very common for these heart failure patients is to give them a diuretic. You guys know what a diuretic is? It makes you pee. It makes you pee. We're going to talk about that here in a second. Actually, it works pretty well. You lower blood volume. You reduce blood pressure. Mean arterial pressure drops. The heart doesn't have to work against as big of a load. The patient feels more comfortable, and the heart is working less strenuously. The number one complaint of patients that are in heart failure that have a diuretic on board is what? Huh? No, they, they can usually, um, they're thirsty, you're right, but they'll drink more water if they're thirsty. They have to get up to pee in the middle of the night like six times and it really is annoying. Okay, Just preparing you for what they're going to tell you. But if you can explain a little of this, say, hey, this is a whole lot better than it was, they're going to say, okay, Isn't that just like dehydrating the patient, essentially? It is dehydrating the patient. It's, it's a quick fix. It works pretty well. Um, the problem is most of those patients probably have to go on for transplant. Yeah. It's t probably tough on the kidneys too, right? It can be tough on the kidneys, yeah. yeah. Well, you got, you got all sorts of systemic problems with the patients in heart failure. Sure. You know, if it's hypertensive here at the aorta, it's hypertensive down at the kidneys as well. So now the kidneys have been operating under a large pressure head. You with me? Yeah. You get disease. We'll look at disease next, uh, arteriosclerosis. Contrary to a lot, what a lot of people think is you've got vessel disease only in certain locations in the body. Like, oh, well, someone's had a heart attack, so the vessels in their chest are bad. The vessels everywhere are bad. It's just the ones in the uh, perfusing heart are of small diameter, so they're the first to show up with an alert because they're small diameter tubing. But all the, all the piping everywhere is actually compromised. It's just that's where you're seeing. And I've got some pretty gnarly pictures of explanted vessels that we'll look at here um, next. Okay, so the heart actually tries to compensate for this situation of elevated mean arterial pressure. And, and there's really three ways that it can try to compromise. Now, not all of them are going to be helpful. Uh, not all of them are going to work, but um, these are the three and kind of in order. So number one, there's an increase in norepinephrine. And this norepinephrine that comes out of uh, the adrenal gland is going to elevate heart rate, okay? So now if you increase heart rate, you increase cardiac output. You with me? Bless you. So the norepinephrine has kind of two functions. It increases heart rate and it increases contractility. Heart rate's not listed on the slide, so you might want to write down down next to contractility. Increases contractility and increases heart rate. Why the increased heart rate? Well, that helps with cardiac output. Why the increased contractility? Contractility, so the heart itself, if you guys remember, it's like if you took a washcloth and you dipped it into a bucket of water, and then you squeezed it like this, you get water out, right? But then if you took it after you had squeezed it and you rang it, you can imagine you would actually squeeze out even more water. You with me? So. Contractility, the heart beats in this ringing motion. That's how it's designed, is to beat in a ringing motion. And so what contractility does is it says make the contractions more forceful. So now the ringing motion doesn't do just, just this. It squeezes a little bit of like one quarter turn more. Well, that inevitably is going to increase stroke volume on this equation. So you can increase cardiac output by releasing norepinephrine by either one of these variables in this equation. 
If you increase heart rate, then this side of the equation goes up. Or if you increase stroke volume, then this side of the equation goes down. So this is a very quick release of um, a androgen, right? Or, a, I'm sorry, a uh, norepinephrine, a stimulant that is going to be kind of a fight or flight sympathetic nervous system. Here's the problem, is over time, what it does is it actually increases peripheral resistance because it actually causes some vasoconstriction to happen out in the smaller vessels. And that increased uh, peripheral resistance is going to lower venous return <coughs> over time. You guys with me? So it's a band-aid fix quickly, but it's a compensatory mechanism that the heart does. Okay, number two, the renin angiotensin system. So now we're at the level of the kidneys. So with the renin angiotensin system, we've got this angiotensin converting enzyme that takes angiotensin one to angiotensin two, if you guys remember that. And this um, increases thirst. Um, so antidiuretic hormone, right? It's released out of where? posterior pituitary gland. That helps to conserve water at the level of the kidneys. And it increases blood pressure. So why would that be a good thing to increase blood pressure or fluid that's in the total circulation? What is the body trying to do? Perfuse tissue. It's on this side. Increase venous return. Increase venous return. Okay, so it's saying, all right, there's a, there's a law here, this is called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. We're gonna get there on the next slide, I think. But Frank Starling Law of the Heart says, if you increase input, it'll result in an increase in output. Simply stated. So, back to our little simplistic diagram. If you bring more blood back to the heart, on the next heartbeat, you'll get more blood out. So your release of antidiuretic hormone, working with the renin angiotensin system at the level of the kidney, is trying to have activity of conserving fluid so that you increase your venous return. This is what the body's trying to do. Now, you all know, because I've already told you part of the story, is that gonna be long-term helpful? No. In fact, it almost makes things a little bit worse in these patients. Because now, instead of lowering blood volume, because I told you what we do medically with diuretics, your body has actually exaggerated the hypertensive nature because now your blood volume is higher and so your pressure is higher. So that one doesn't last very long either. So we're talking about days, weeks, maybe months, maybe years of the body doing these first two things. Heart failure patients or heart disease patients usually are in the state for decades. So you can Google like how long can someone live with heart disease? Well, it just depends on them. But usually people that don't have a heart attack can expire right away. They'll be around for a decade or two. And then there's gonna be a lot of remodeling that takes place. Okay, third compensatory mechanism. This is really the only one that works long term. And it kind of is what we simulate with our diuretics. So atrial natriuretic peptide, ANP. And on this diagram, it's abbreviated NPs. These are protein sequences that are manufactured in the atrium. And they are released into the bloodstream when the heart is stretching too much. And they have two activities. They have the activity of being a diuretic, which is what we talked about, and now you lower blood volume. Well, they also have the activity of increasing the excretion of sodium, which is a naturesis, which you see on this slide. Water follows sodium, and so this is the mechanism by which it increases water removal is it makes the 
uh, membrane at the level of the kidney more permeable to sodium, you lose more sodium and the water falls. So this A and P release is why these patients kind of last as long as they do on their own, even if they're in heart failure. So three mechanisms. The first two really don't work very long. The last one can work a little longer in the years category. But then ultimately, you know, the heart itself is going to um, not be able to comp uh, compensate any longer. So here's our Frank Starling Law of the Heart. He compensates using these mechanisms and then it decompensates. And it does this compensate, decompensate cycle for years Ultimately, the heart will progress into a stage of heart failure. And heart failure clinically is described in a number of different ways, but let's put this particular metric is, um, you, you guys understand what ejection fraction is? So ejection fraction is the, long, is the percent of blood that the heart ejects out of the left ventricle each cycle. And so, if we're engineers, we're gonna say the heart is a pump. It is not a super efficient pump. Although it actually has quite longevity, but it's about a 70% efficient pump, 70, 75%. So normal ELF values are 70 to 75%. So that means 25% of the blood that's in the left ventricle stays in the left ventricle in healthy normal patients. So if EF values get down to 40% um, or below, we call that heart failure. So more than half of the blood is staying in the heart. So you'll run into patients that are in heart failure that have EFs of 35, 39%, you know, 40%. They look horrible. They're pale, okay? Uh, they have trouble breathing. They're listless, I mean, they can't, they don't have a lot of energy. I mean, they're not oxygenating their system very well at all. Does that make sense? So there's a bunch of like, you know, sports medicine work on looking at, you know, elite athletes. I mean, I think the highest EF that I've seen in elite athletes might be in the 80s. You know, like a five, 10% bump over this number, it, you know, puts you like in this category of like, oh, you know, think about that. I mean, your pump is 10% more efficient than everybody else's. Probably won't get tired as quickly. <coughs> Think about the opposite. Go in the opposite direction of lead athletes, you're dropping 30 to 35 points. I'm telling you, seven to 10% increase is lead athlete level. 30 to 35 point decrease, they're barely alive, okay? So the body itself and heart failure is trying to compensate, and this heart is now working harder. It's got this monster pressure head. Um, the heartbeat is elevated in heart failure patients because, again, it's doing everything that it can by elevating the heartbeat. So the pump is working less efficiently and it's working harder. If that was a, a working engine in an automobile and you put your, your hand on it, what do you think? Would it be warm, hot, overheating? What do you think it would, how do you think it would feel? It would be overheating, okay? So these hearts in these patients are abnormally active. And so we get into this situation known as cardiac tachia, which is a phrase that's referring to uh, body wasting. These patients have severe weight loss. And what's interesting is their heart, while their body is kind of wasting away, their heart is actually enlarging. The muscle, this is striated muscle, so there's three types of muscle, you guys remember? We've got cardiac and skeletal, which are both striated muscle. And then we have smooth muscle, which is very different. If you load striated muscle, it will respond by hypertrophy or enlargement. Right, that's the whole principle of, you know, why you go to the gym, right, and work out. You know, you get your, you know, physique. If you load the muscle, it responds by enlarging the muscle. So if you put a load on this heart, it's gonna respond just like your biceps, brachii. It's gonna respond, you know, just like any other striated muscle, skeletal or cardiac.
So this is enlarging while the rest of the body is actually wasting away. Okay. So what are some symptoms of heart disease, specifically chronic heart failure or congestive heart failure? And we're talking really on the left side of the heart. That's exclusively what we've been dialing in on today is left side of heart failure. So the causes could be ischemic heart disease, right? So the vascular plumbing that goes to the heart muscle itself, those blood vessels are diseased and they're narrowing. Um, it could be systemic hypertension, like what we talked about. Mean arterial pressure is going up. Usually, if vascular disease is rampant, hypertension is high. Hypertension actually causes vascular disease. And we'll, and we'll look at this uh, a little bit later. Could have been mitral or aortic valve, or aortic valve disease. So the mitral and the aortic valve, these are the two most common valve diseases. We'll talk more about that next week. But the reason these two are more common is being diseased versus the tricuspid. Why do you think that is? Increased pressure. This side, the left side has higher pressures than the right side. I prefer that than the old statement of the left side of the heart is the working side of the heart. It makes it sound like the right side of the heart doesn't do anything. So if you took it away and you never sent the blood to the lungs, would it matter? Yeah. <laughs> They're both important, but the pressures here are higher. So I like, I like the answer of the pressures on the left side of the heart are elevated in comparison to the right side of the heart. I don't love the idea that the right side of the heart is not a working side of the heart. Yeah. You can't live without it. Okay, it could be valve disease, or it could be a underlying uh, myocardial disease. Okay, it could be the Ashcroft bodies. You guys remember the Ashcroft bodies? All right, post-strep infection could actually get the depositions and, and a hypersensitivity situation in, in, in the heart. So the morphology of these hearts, they're enlarged, that's hypertrophy. They have a dilated ventricle, this thing blows out. Um, and they get pulmonary congestion and edema. Because if this side of the heart backs up, we talked about this already numerous times, it goes back to the lungs. And now they have trouble breathing. So the largest impact in left-sided heart failure is on the pulmonary circuit. Does that make sense? I'll say it one more time. The biggest impact in left-sided CHF, left side of heart failure, is on the pulmonary circuit. So if we contrast that with, um, oh wait, hang on, sorry, symptoms, and then we're gonna contrast it. So they have uh, dyspnea, or shortness of breath, they have a cough, orthopenia, right? This is shortness of breath when? Laying down. Yeah. Laying down. Tachycardia, what's that? Elevated heart rate, which we talked about, that should make sense. Uh, mitral regurgitation, so that's the bicuspid valve here. Why, why are they getting some regurgitation happening here? Because the pressures are really high, okay? You actually could, in extreme cases, get prolapsing of the valve, where it goes the opposite direction, okay? Atrial fit, so from an electrical system standpoint, the atrium could be in fibrillation. Okay, because it's, bless you, it's actually having the sun electrical signals faster than normal, so you could get a fibrillation that takes place. All right, let's contrast this with the right side of the heart. So right-sided heart failure. So we're on this side. So right-sided heart failure, the most common reason for it is left-sided heart failure with pulmonary congestion. Because now if it goes from the lungs and backs up, where's it gonna go? Right. To the right side, and it's gonna affect the right side of the heart now. However, there could be lung diseases that would cause right-sided heart failure that are unrelated to left-sided heart failure. So for example, in an extreme circumstance, like ARDS, diffuse alveolar disease, that we talked about in a respiratory section. If you've got a parenchymal lung disease that's affecting the lungs, this could actually back up 
blood flow to the right side. Or if there's vascular disease in the lung, which is a little less common. The most common is in parenchymal diseases or, or vascular abnormalities or diseases with the lungs. It is left-sided heart failure that progresses and gets worse. Now the patient's in global heart failure of the left side and the right side. But here, in contrast, we look back at our diagram, we can appreciate that that left, that right side failure, the biggest impact's gonna be on the systemic cir uh, circulation or the systemic circuit. And so if we look at where the downstream uh, vessels um, that fed the superior and inferior vena cava, particularly the inferior vena cava, you see that the liver is right there. And we kind of alluded to this when we were talking about liver diseases. I don't know if you remember that, but we were talking about um, ascites, right? We were talking about varices, and we are talking about severe alcoholic hepatitis or even cirrhotic liver disease, alcoholic cirrhosis. We talked about the liver itself being a problem and how it's all full of the portal circulation. So you can get issues associated with the liver now unrelated to you know, liver trauma, the liver could be fine, but the right side is backed up, so this puts extra pressure. You've got portal hypertension on the liver, right? And this hepatic portal system becomes hypertensive, and now you've got congestion in the liver. That's what this word, this what this means, right? We've got pleural effusions um, that happen in the lung, and we have peripheral edema because you've backed up the peripheral venous circulation. Okay, question for you. And then we'll shift gears into um, arteriosclerosis. So left-sided heart failure may lead to right-sided right -sided heart failure owing to or because of which? Excessive volume retention, poor perfusion of the right coronary, increased right ventricular afterload, or arterial hypotension. Increased right ventricular afterload, right? Correct, so this system here, the afterload, it, it has to work against is this direction to the lung. So if lung pressure is high, it backs it up this way. You guys with me? It's kind of like what we saw here, but instead, this is the aorta backing up to the left ventricle. Okay? Questions on heart failure? Okay, we're going to transition now to um, arterial sclerosis. And we're going to look at um, a couple of different types of arterial sclerosis. So this is defined as an abnormal thickening and hardening of the vessels. And I've got some pictures and data for you on like how hard is it? How hard does it get? Um, it, it almost gets as hard, the vessel almost gets as hard as bone. Okay? It becomes extremely calcified. I'll show you this. So Arterial sclerosis as a disease, this is taking place when the vessels get injured. Did you have a question? I was just gonna say, in the cadaver lab, one of the bodies has, like their aorta feels like PVC pipe. It's yeah. so hardened. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Incredible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think I told you guys the story, but I'll show you the sample. I have a picture of the sample here in a second. So we, we were working on a study and we were getting, um, uh, not cadavers, but we were getting explants from patients and they either had a, a stent in them or, you know, they were, they were in older patients. And so in these older patients, we were trying to characterize their disease state and um, we would have to excise them. And, and just like what some of you have experienced, we, we, we cut them out with some large scissors and we get them out on the bench top and, and then we would fillet it down the center and then try to open it up, you know, kind of pin it back. So you can imagine a tube and you're opening it up and now it becomes like a rectangle pin it open. Well, when we made that initial incision, you know, we were all being super careful and, you know, we were using, you know, some, some really fine scissors and they wouldn't cut through it. And 
And finally, we started using uh, just straight scalp uh, uh, razor blades, not even scalpel blades for the worst, just straight razor blades, okay, like you can buy in Home Depot. And literally, it would be like crunch, crunch, crunch. And you would get like halfway through, and you'd have to flip it around. And if you looked at the side you just used, you know, the, the, the straight sided razor blade is, you know, usually like this. This side was completely jagged. And literally, it didn't just dull the blade, it tore the metal up. I'll, I'll show you a picture, it's crazy. But this is what's happening in our bloodstream based upon what happens with our biology. A lot of this is diet dependent, but it's also just our environment, what we what we interact with. So, um, the vessel has to become injured. Now, how does a vessel get injured? Are you talking about trauma? What are you talking about? I'm talking about trauma or damage or injury a little bit over a long period of time. So, some examples. Um, this injury can be caused by hypertension. So the lining of the blood vessels have endothelial cells. If you have high blood pressure, those endothelial cells feel that pressure, and they may not respond well. They, some of them may die, and then you expose the underlying tunica media, the middle layer that has smooth muscle cells. And those smooth muscle cells are unlike endothelial cells well, they'll just continue to grow, okay? Um, you can have um, pollutants in your blood that are circulating. So a lot of the carcinogenic agents that are found in like tobacco smoke are endothelial cell toxins and will cause vascular damage. So that's why smoking is linked to cardiovascular disease because the toxins in cigarette smoke or tobacco smoke, I should say, cause microvascular damage. It's not just cancer, it's why it's linked to cardiovascular disease. So some of the warning labels that you see, if you pay attention, don't just say cancer, they also say cardiovascular disease. Um, if you have dyslipidemia, if you have high lipid in your bloodstream, high cholesterol. So imagine a tube, okay? Let's pretend the tube is a straw and the end of one straw is in your mouth, and the end of the other straw is in a milkshake versus a glass of water. <coughs> Which is easier to bring fluid into your mouth? The water. So if the consistency of the blood is more viscous, meaning there's more fat floating in it, you guys with me, you understand the analogy? So that's why fat content in the blood, cholesterol level in the blood causes problems, is you're causing trauma to the wall of the vessel because you have to have higher pressures to move it. Just like the drinking a shake through a straw analogy. All right, so this is very similar to other types of healings with um, arteriosclerosis. We've got, um, just to orient you on this slide, see how we're doing. Uh, we've got our intimal layer here. This intimate, intimal layer is the endothelium. This is the blood flow surface. And then we've got an internal elastic lamina, which is this blue dotted line. And then we have another border, which is the external elastic lamina, and in between are smooth muscle cells, and that's the tunica media. So tunica intima with the endothelium, tunica media with the smooth muscle cells, and then tunica adventitia. Tunic is just a Latin word that means coat or covering. You know, like an old English term for a coat or a tunic. So tunica intima is the inner coat, tunica media is the middle coat, and tunica adventitia is the outer coat. And if you've got trauma and damage to the endothelium, you're gonna lose its capability for anti-thrombogenic and vasodilatory capabilities. That's what the endothelial cells do, is the endothelium are a coating that's anti-thrombogenic. It prevents the blood from clotting in that particular area. And you know that that's a good thing because if you have a clot, you could block blood flow. And if that clot is in the coronary circulation that goes to the heart, or in the circulation like the carotids that perfuse the brain, you could actually lose blood flow to critical organs. So we've got a situation here where we've got normal on the left side 
and we've got disease on the right, and we're going as a progression of disease from left to right. So you can see the proximity of the endothelium to the internal elastic lamina. Basically, one's right on top of the other normally. And if you have damage to these endothelial cells, right, you can actually recruit the smooth muscle cells to migrate beyond this border of the internal elastic lamina and start to proliferate. And that's what smooth muscle cells would like to do. They like to migrate into that tunica intima and multiply or proliferate. They go through mitotic divisions. As they do that, they make more extracellular matrix, and that causes the tunica intima to thicken. And as it thickens, the overall lumen of the blood vessel, if you're looking down the tube, narrows. They're not functional as muscle cells. They don't, they don't contract. Uh, they, they literally are in a disease state because they're not supposed to be there. And so after a while, you've got a thicker tunica intima that's taking place. So we have two different types of arterial sclerosis that I want to characterize today. And the first type is arterial low sclerosis. So there's like an extra LO in there. And the second type is called atherosclerosis. And athero sclerosis is the one that you most often hear about. Okay. But the broad category is arteriosclerosis, which talks about the thickening of the intima. It literally translates to vessel hardening. A sclerosis is a hardening. Arterial low sclerosis tends to affect smaller vessels like the arteries and the arterioles. It happens to be closely associated with mean arterial pressures being elevated or hypertension. Atherosclerosis is a disease where you get this atheroma that forms. So AS, atherosclerosis, is the one that everybody's worried about because they've been eating too many potato chips or you know they're not getting enough exercise. It's sort of a subcategory of arteriosclerosis or hardening of the vessels. Does that make sense? So you have hypertension targeting small vasculature because of high blood pressures. And then we've got atherosclerosis where you get uh, an atheroma which translates to gruel. Gruel. So that's the most common type. And what you're seeing here in this picture is an example of AS or atherosclerosis. And the gruel inside, if it gets large enough, so it's a little bit of a spin off of this, arteriosclerosis, athro, you get this thickening that takes place, and you get some muscle cells that are replicating here, but you've got this um, athroma that's forming. This athroma is made up of cellular debris, it's made up of cholesterol, it's made up of macrophages, lymphocytes, what we call foam cells. Foam cells, so these ones right here are macrophages that have kind of the rough, ruffled edge, but the macrophages that have the, the yellow dots inside, those are foam cells that have ingested uh, calcium, cholesterol, or fat. So, so a macrophage turns into a foam cell as it scavenges in this particular atheroma. You'll also appreciate in some of the histology, if this gets really big, it might have a necrotic center in the large vessels. Um, it may actually have its own blood supply. It almost acts a little like a cancer in a way, where you'll get um, neovascularization or new blood vessel formation inside of the atheroma to try to perfuse the tissue so it doesn't die. Okay? Pretty crazy. So how does this progress? What happens? Well, it's a multiple step process. We're talking specifically about the atheroma or AS. We've got endothelium in this top picture. You can see the three tunics, the intima media and the adventitia. Um, we've got injury that takes place and you can see chronic endothelial cell injury. Here's the list of some of the things that I talked about. All right, so we've got uh, hyperlipidemia I think I said dyslipidemia, but that's just abnormal. 
Hyperlipidemia is specifically saying elevators, so that'd be more accurate than just <coughs> Hypertension, smoking, right? And the list goes on. There's all sorts of things that could cause these diseases. Those are the top three. High fat, high pressure, high toxins in like tobacco smoke. And what happens is those endothelium respond to that chronic injury. And now you get inflammation at the level of the blood vessel. So I just want to remind you, if you look back at our first lecture, first time we were together, I made a promise to you, right? I made a promise that we would talk about inflammation and we were going to talk about it through the entire semester. And here we are in the last unit of cardiovascular and it still hasn't gotten old, okay? Well, you might think it's gotten old, but we're still talking about it. So you guys know all of the steps in the inflammatory process that's happening at the level of the blood vessel wall. That's what's happening here. So, if I had to pick one disease that I would be most interested in that could have the biggest impact on all the diseases mechanistically, what would I study? Inflammation, right? And that's why inflammation has become so important to me as a scientist, and most everything that I do is related to inflammation in some capacity, because it, it makes such a huge impact in all the diseases that we, most of the diseases that we interact with. So now this endothelial cell has a loss of function, it has dysfunction, and you get all this uh, lipoprotein that accumulates in the vessel wall, like we saw, on that previous slide. So what does it look like? So we're just, we're just walking through from here to the injury state of inflammation, and then we're looking at macrophages being activated. We have smooth muscle cells propagating. We have smooth muscle cell recruitment, and this continues. And so if you get to this bottom picture here, now you can appreciate where this athroma has grown. It literally grows in it, it start, if you go back here, look at this nice smooth surface, you can imagine if this was the end of the tube, you're, you're looking at the end of this tube um, kind of in cross section like this. And then now with the disease state, if, if, if this was the old lumen interface with this intraelastic lamina, you see this lesion happening like so, and you're gonna get all this garbage it kind of grows in this region of the athroma. And this L is where your lumen is. And now when you look at this under angiography or CT or imagery, you would say, you know, what we're worried about here, and let me, let me make it more aggressive to bring it closer to home, is let's say this is in a coronary vessel and we see that this is something like so, right? And we've got all these diseases and this is the lumen. We say, what I'm worried about in your grandfather is when I look at three of the main vessels in, that perfuse the heart, um, I'm seeing that we've got coronary circulation that's blocked about 92 to 95%. Does that make sense? So that, that's, what, that's about what this would be. It'd be like a 92 to 95% blockage. Okay, now I'm waiting. And then you want to soak it in. How's that? <laughs> okay. So if we continue, on the pathway of disease, right? We've got monocytes and macrophages that get recruited. You guys could probably pick up the lecture from here and explain the rest of the steps, right? What, what we have is we've got free radicals showing up. Where do the free radicals come from? Let's, let's jog our memory. Macrophages. From the macrophages, from the respiratory verse. Well, <clears throat> if we've got excessive uh, fat and cholesterol that's there, why does it get oxidized? Because you've got free radicals floating around from the macrophages that you've recruited. That makes sense? The infiltrate is taken up by the macrophages and that makes the foam cells, right? And you can see the foam cells are the swollen macrophages with stuff inside. You get platelets adhering because you have a disease, you have a trauma, you have damage. The endothelium have no longer, uh, they've lost their attachment, so you're exposing some of the underlying basement membrane. 
And that actually is, a, is an itis for platelets to adhere and to stimulate clot formation. We got our smooth muscle cells recruited into the area like we saw with uh, arterial sclerosis slides. And they start making more smooth muscle cells. They proliferate and make more matrix. That adds to this narrowing of the lumen. And then you get an excessive amount of lipid accumulation. So here's kind of where we are in this state. Here is our internal elastic uh, membrane. So that's kind of, you know, would be that inner border that would surround. Uh, and we've got our astroma that's happening on the far right. We've got <clears throat> recruitment of monocytes becoming tissue macrophages. They turn into foam cells as they phagocytose all the different debris. You get smooth muscle cells that migrate out of where their tunica media layer is into the tunica intima, replicating, laying down more matrix. We've got a plaque that forms in this area. And if it's stable, that's a term that means that we're not worried about it rupturing. Is it ruptures, you could actually perforate the vessel and the patient can sanguine. If it's unstable, which is a complicated plaque, that's where it's emergent and usually they want to treat the patient right away. So they say, okay, we're going to watch the patient or we're worried about the stability of the plaque. And so we want to get in there and treat right away. And we'll talk about treatments next week. We're not going to get that far. Um, I've got a couple more slides. I just want to show you a couple of um, histology slides just as we close out and we walk into the biggest feasting day of the year. I thought this would be most appropriate to end on. <laughs> you're like, you're messed up, Kelly. Um, so this virus plaque with the C-reactive protein, what is that? In short, C-reactive protein that's found there that collects, that stimulates the complement cascade. And that's an important player in inflammation, as we all know. So that should surprise us. A couple of slides, a couple of gruesome slides before you dive into turkey dinner, okay? And then we'll pick it up here when we get back. So just to complete the story. So what you've got here is histology. And we're looking at the histo over on the far left. It's a trichrome image, so you kind of appreciate the L is the lumen. The arrow is pointing to the internal elastic lamina. In the middle picture, you can see the arrow pointing to the internal elastic lam lamina, which is that black squiggly line. It's elastin, so it's like a <coughs> stretchy rubber band. And so if you have a stretchy rubber band, you let it go. It kind of has kind of that squiggly form. Um, back over on the far left, um, the F is the fibrous plaque. Uh, the, the C is the necrotic core. The blue is all new collagen that's been laid down, presumably by the smooth muscle cells that have migrated in and have proliferated. I'm blocking you, sorry. Um, and then over on the far right, you've got excessive calcification and neovascularization that forms. The neovascularization, there's small arrows. That's the new blood vessels that are forming there, kind of like what happens with the cancer. This is like a mass of tissue that's grown that's not supposed to be there. So it's trying to create its own blood supply. And then the arrow heads, the stump, stump, uh, stumpy little arrow heads are calcification of the vessel. So this thing gets really, really calcified. So let me just show you this. This is that picture from our lab of a vessel that's been filleted open. It's hard to tell what's going on here, but let me orient you. Uh, so this is the proximal area. I know that because of the suture that we tied. And this is the distal area. This is no, quote unquote normal aged vessel. This is a 77-year-old patient, so there is some disease here. But you can see how much smoother it is here until you get to about right here. And then this, all the way to here, is an unstable plaque that is super, super crunchy. Here it is in higher magnification. This is like a giant piece of calcium that's as hard as stone. Okay. So on that note, maybe have extra salad on Thursday, okay? And I'll see you guys next Monday. Happy Thanksgiving.